Okay, here I have something which I want to go through. One great critical theorist, which is a real definite group of physical people, right? Yeah. Not just an idea, whatever. One is Walter Benjamin, and I just to show you the books which have just come out again of Walter Benjamin. I let it go through. Walter Benjamin um, was particularly interested in literature. He came from Berlin in, in Germany. Um, he married. He had one son. He did his dissertation in Switzerland. You were in Switzerland, right? Yeah. Um, and then he uh, uh, stayed in Frankfurt as a journalist, but with a, uh, anonymously, so that the Nazis would not notice it. Uh, 1933. Um, he had shared with all the other critical theorists the mission that the Jews had to rescue Europe the culture, the civilization. And so he stayed too long. Then he fled to France with his sick sister. He was put in a concentration camp in France. They let him go. In. Then he wanted to come to the States. Was he Jew? A Jew, yeah. But why? He, why hmm? how, how come they let him go? Well, they didn't, didn't let them go. So they, so they didn't kill everybody? They let communists go, too. Jew. They didn't all stay, so... Um, Yahudi? Yahudi, okay. And then he, um, uh, so he fled then, he wanted to come to New York. Remember, they all, the institute fled from Frankfurt to New York, there to Columbia University, got a building there, so he wanted to go there and join the others. So he went to Marseille. Marseille was the Vichy government, so it was a fascist government under Pinter. Pinter was the general who defended Verdun in the First World War, so Greek war hero, and Hitler made him into the president of the southern part of France. Only the southern part was free, the northern part toward England was occupied by the Germans, but they left half of France unoccupied. So therefore Benjamin went to Marseille, and in Marseille, for Marseille he wanted to go through Spain, fascist Spain, fascist Lisbon, uh, and then to New York. And there, um, the something happened. Mrs. Roosevelt had uh, agents in um, Marseille, and these agents got Jews and non-Jews, but artists and intellectuals and so on, across the Pyrenees Mountains and to Lisbon and to America. But Roosevelt wanted to get in contact with the Pétain government in Vichy, Therefore, she had to cancel the agents. So when Benjamin came to Marseille, no agents were there. So then he climbed up, with the heart condition, he climbed up the Pyrenees, up to the little railroad town, Port Bou, Port Bou, uh, um, a Spanish town, Spanish-French border town. And so going up uh, on the mountains with a wife, of another scholar in New York, of the critical theorists. So critical theorists are real people, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, then he uh, <laughs> came up there, had a heart attack on the way, but the woman, Gurland was her name, later on Eric Fromm married her, they married among each other. So the, uh, she got divorced from her husband, and Eric Fromm, another great scholar of the Frankfurt School, a psychologist who was in New York for 25 years, he then, uh, she, she helped him to go up with her son. So they came to a restaurant. The restaurant belonged to a Falange man. Falange man was Spanish fascist. And so in the corner were sitting German, German Gestapo people with their leather coats, like Walter, our friend, mm. has a coat on. <laughs> all that. So uh, they were sitting in the corner. So he called to the American ambassador in Marseille and said, I'm stuck here. Why was he stuck here? Because on that same day, the Spanish fascists declared that non-state people could not go through their country. So that means he had a visa to go to New York, but he had not an exit visa out of Vichy or out of Germany or whatever, and therefore he was stateless. That was in his passport, stateless. So they didn't let him go. So therefore, he fell, fell in despair. The ambassador could not help him. Like when I was in, in, in Serbia and the war broke out, I called the American ba ambassador. Never called them. They're hopeless people, and they cannot help you neither, in spite of uh, all the taxes they eat up. 
So <laughs> nevertheless, then the uh, so he stayed there overnight, but he had no way out anymore. So he didn't know where to go. He had already planned to commit suicide a few years earlier, and this picture which you see over there, Angulus Novus. We can turn the light on later on. You can see it. Yeah. Um, that is from Paul Clay. Paul Clay was an uh, uh, what is this style called? Um, the, uh, the the artistic style. The expre expressionist. There was an expressionist. So is a connection between the uh, critical theory and certain art forms, like for instance expressionism. That angel there. That is an expressionist painting. You can take it from the wall if you want to, and. Uh, and show it. Yeah, please. Can I do that? Do you want me to get it? Yeah, you can get Yeah, let it go through. Okay, so, did you have a new thought? <laughs> now put it over here. You can put it over here. So, did you? Yeah, good. Okay. Yeah, that is wonderful. So, there you feel better. Okay, let's just have this, uh, this painting here. You can look at it. So, this angel, which Paul Clay painted in the 20s, so Expressionism and Critical Theory and Expressionism belong together, right? So that means you have a theory like Liberalism or Fascism or whatever, and these theories have also an artistic expression. This is the artistic expression there. That is an angel. What is this angel doing? He looks forward or backwards toward the historical process, and he sees the horrible chaos. Think of ISIS, the killing, the decapitation, the murder, and so on and so on. Uh, so, and the wind comes from paradise, the wind of progress, and blows into his wings and pushes him backward. So, he, with his back of his head, he moves into the future. So, one doesn't know what is there. But before him, all the ruins of the cities, and so on, are accumulating before his eyes. So it is the angel of history, it's an image of what history is like or was like for clay and then Benjamin bought that pa painting there and gave it to Sholem when he uh, planned to commit suicide. He wrote it to his friends that he would depart and he inherited what he had and he gave clay there, this clay picture, to Sholem. Now, Sholem is a great scholar about Kabbalism. Kabbalism is Jewish mysticism. So uh, this picture then went to Sholem, and Sholem put it into the museum, into the museum, art museum in Jerusalem. So today, the original is in the art museum in Jerusalem. Okay, now we go forward. He sits there. Nobody helps him. Mrs. Skurland is alone. So he takes uh, a poison. Um, what was it? It was uh, uh, well. It's a very well-known poison which you killed. Cyanide, people. wasn't it? Si it was cyanide, probably cyanide. a cyanide. So he had met a poet, a Jewish poet in Marseille, and he shared with him the portion of cyanide he had. The other one never committed suicide, but that night uh, Benjamin took his part and ate the cyanide. So he slowly died through the night. And in the morning, he was close to his death. He called Mrs. Gurland, gave her a letter to Adorno, which is another great critical theorist who was already in New York, and um, that he uh, came to the end of his life. He could not, didn't know any way out anymore, and therefore he wanted to go that way. So then he died. And now, when you see the, the unbelievable confusion, so when you are a critical person, you see, you are already because of being critical in an uncritical society, you are already a revolutionary. Uh, you, when, when you follow the five pillars, or when you follow the Ten Commandments, you are already, when you do that in an immoral society, you are already a revolutionary. And your life may somehow take strange ways. So, he, um, uh, he uh, no less he, uh, now what came first of all was the doctor. It was a fascist doctor. Under fascism, you are not allowed to commit suicide. All the people who help you will be put into prison for so many years. So the doctor didn't want to do that to these people, Mrs. Gurland and so on, so he wrote that he had a brain hemorrhage and did not write suicide. So there is the first thing. 
Then he had in his pocket, he had a letter for a monastery in Spain, so that he would be, a uh, Catholic gave him that, so that the monastery would help him if he needed help. So they saw that letter, and they thought he was a Catholic, but he was a Jew. So they called a priest, and the priest came in and gave him the last sacrament, in spite of the fact that he was not a Christian, but was a Jew. Then they uh, finally had to bury him. So Mrs. Gerland gave to the cemetery, gave money, that they would bury him. It is a cemetery which looks out into the Mediterranean from Port Boo. And so he uh, then gave them the money, but the money disappeared. So they threw his body somewhere, uh, anonymously, and nobody knows where it is. They but then him. they found out... They didn't bury him, bury him? Well, they buried him somewhere, but without a name. Okay. It was not a normal burial. So, but then people came and wanted to visit this grave. And when they found out that there so many people came, there was a business to be made, and they collected money, but they made up a wrong grave, in which he wasn't in that grave at all. <laughs> Three months later, his uh, his cousin came, this philosopher, the, the Jewish philosopher, Hannah Arendt, Hannah Arendt came, and uh, she found that there was no grave, and that they made, made up a grave, and they collected money for him. So then, for 30 years, they collected money. Then the German government was supposed to do something for him because he was so famous. So the German government then asked an architect in Israel to make a monument for him. So he, they made a monument in the cemetery of Port Bu, which looks out the lake. Then the question was, who will pay for it? Then the German parliament refused to pay because he was on the left. So when you are in a capitalistic country like this, the bourgeois here, the left is bad. You know, the little Bernie, Bernie there, he is not, cannot be elected because he's a socialist, right? Mm -hmm. They start in 1880, they start to murder communists in New York and all over the place. So uh, Hitler was much better. The, the fascists are much better than the liberals in killing. They, but kill, they all kill, kill them in New York. In, uh, in New York, uh, workers were killed who were communists. Oh. And there was a big procession of the workers, you know, the union workers in New York. And they have described it in these three volumes up there. Um, so long before Hitler started killing communists, he killed 27 million of them. Oh. He, they, they started, to, liberals started killing them all over the place already, but in smaller numbers. Okay, so, uh, but then, so the story finally ended that there was a German president who had defended his father in the Nuremberg trial. We'll see the Nuremberg trial somewhere. You know that when the war was over, the fascists in Tokyo and the fascists in, in Berlin were put on trial. So in this Tokyo trial, this, this German president defended his father who was a war criminal. So, um, and this president was so ashamed about the whole thing that he did pay. Germany finally did pay for that monument. So finally, Benjamin has his monument. So now you see the whole thing. Then came one Benjamin Renaissance after the other. So in the 50s and then again and so on and Adorno and Horkheimer, his friends, mainly Adorno, who was his student and his friend, then uh, they, um, you know, always printed his letters and books and so on. And there is a new Renaissance like this, and you see that in that uh, thing there, right, in these books there. So he has written a lot. His writing is a little bit difficult. We have one student, a former student, Mike Ott, Professor Mike Ott. He is now working on Benjamin. And we will bring out, write a book with essays by Dustin and me and son, all about Benjamin there. Okay, so that is one thing. So I let this go through. There you can see what he looked like. And there's much more to be said. He was friends with uh, a great uh, Marxist writer, uh, the um, Bertolt, Brecht, Bertolt Brecht. Yeah, uh, I, we have had a student here who has written his dissertation about Bertolt Brecht. He's in Germany now, and he did his habilitation in Munich about Bertolt Brecht. We had a president here, uh, Dieter Hennecke, who wrote his dissertation about Brecht, but because Brecht is on the left, he could not make any money with this here, so then he went into, into uh, uh, administration. So if you cannot teach and if you cannot do research, you go into the administration. That's what he did, and he was a very good administrator. Dieter Hennecke 
You have the Dieter Hennige building there. You have the Dieter Hennige uh, foreign uh, travel office and so on. So he was a beautiful guy. Okay, number two here. There an article in the Times, I think, the New York Times. The New York Review. So don't think lowly about American uh, journalism. <laughs> they do bring up nicely. And when you look in the New York Times or the New York uh, Times Review or so, you will see also the critical theory. Here you have one. Remember, our, our title is not only the critical theory, but the most advanced part of the critical theory. So, but we want to start in baby steps, you know, from the beginning, so that we get the whole picture. But one of them, the second generation, is Jürgen Habermas. Here you have the name, Jürgen Habermas, professor in Frankfurt, is now emeritus, so he's uh, pensioned. But he played a great role in presenting the critical theory in Europe, particularly in Germany and so on, more than here. But he came over here at Northwestern University, a very good university near Chicago. Uh, there he taught every year. I don't know, he may still go there. So here is an article which is called The Vanishing Europe of Jürgen Habermas. So the article is about what Habermas is doing now. Habermas has written a book which is called The Lure of Technocracy. Technocracy, okay? Let's say what that means. It means that he criticizes the government in Brussels. You know that the government is situated in Europe in Strasbourg. It's one part but the economic part is particularly in Brussels. That is the reason why ISIS is in Brussels, right? <laughs> ISIS is attacking Paris because Paris is the center of the bourgeois enlightenment and the bourgeois revolution, remember? We said that there is a conflict between religion and the enlightenment. That's our first antagonism, the religious and the secular, right? So, but they came from Brussels because Brussels is the, is the, is the uh, uh, government organization, particularly the economic organization, and so on, of the whole European Union. That means all 28 states, which goes up to Hungary and Poland and so on. Okay, so what he says is that the technocrats have taken over in Brussels. That goes back to Horkheimer, who is the uh, founder of the critical theory. Horkheimer said there were three alternative futures. The first alternative future would be the administered or the technocratic society. The second one would be the war society, and the third one would be the reconciled society. You have that on your road map under D. There you can see these alternative futures. Yeah. Now, what he says now is that this first future, the totally administered, bureaucratic, computerized, and so on, society, technocratic society is, has, is happening in Brussels. What does that mean? It means that democracy goes to pieces. That means instead of making decisions from below, it is left to technicians and experts. It becomes expert type of a culture, and the people from below cannot have no influence anymore on their fate. Whereas from Brussels, they govern into all the national, 28 national states, up down to decisions of ecology or whatever, into every village. And the people have no say in all that. So the technocrats kill democracy. Like money here kills democracy. Clinton is not ashamed to say that she has so much money to go. Uh, Trump uh, has so much money to go. That is almost something good, that they have so much money on the bank and so on and so on. They're all paid. That means it's not a democracy, it's a plutocracy. Pluto is the god of wealth among the Romans, so it is called plutocracy. Okay, so, and he takes as an example Greece. Because the European Union, and particularly the Germans, have imposed an austerity program on Greece, and not only on Greece, but also on uh, on Spain, on Portugal, on Italy, and so on. So that means people are taxed tremendously. Uh, so people, their living standard is lowered so that they save and can pay their debts. So they gave Greek uh, loan and so on. It started out with a derivative from, what is this damn corporation called? My grandson works for them. This, um, it doesn't even matter, one 
the, they have these trades made. AIG? Really? No, no, no. It's another. It's a corporation in New York. One of the Wall Street things. Goldman there. Sachs. Goldman Sachs. There. Yeah. Goldman Sachs gave a derivative. A derivative means that you bet on people paying their debts back. If they don't pay their debts back, then you derive tremendous profits from them. Nobody knows how, what the mathematics of the whole shit is. Not even those who sell it know it exactly. When they start explaining it, they get stuck in the middle. It's questionable if Einstein even would know what, what the mathematics is. So, nevertheless, they sold such a derivative to Greece so that Greece could enter the European Union. Because when you want to enter the European Union, you have to be debt-free. So they took that derivative in order to pay their debts. And when the derivative was starting to function, it was a fraud. So now Greece was in the European Union, but the debt thing was not solved because the derivative from this shit place, what is the name Goldman of it? Sachs. Goldman Sachs. did not work. It was a fraud. So now it starts the whole history of bailing them out. But... The, it was imposed on them. So it's not that the Greeks could say, this is the way how we want to pay our debts or whatever. But the debtor, somehow, particularly Germany, dictated to them, and Brussels dictated to them. And then there were other cases like Greece, and that was particularly Italy, and it was also Spain and Portugal, and also Ireland. They all could not live up to the economic standards. Some of them, because they are Catholic, Catholics have opposed the capitalism. Protestants, less. Therefore, Protestant countries are more capitalistic than Catholic countries. And the less capitalistic countries, when they take up loans, they cannot pay back adequately. Then come these derivatives. But when they cannot back adequately pay back, then they have to take new loans in order to pay the interest. That was also done with Yugoslavia and so on. That is why they collapsed under the neoliberal counter-revolution of 1989. So, nevertheless, that is the protest of Habermas now, that the, 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 then the Greeks did vote in a socialistic government, and that socialistic government, in the beginning of last year, I think, refused to pay anything whatsoever. So then that government went to, uh, went to Brussels, and there were all kinds of negotiations, and the question is, should the Greeks be thrown out of the European Union and uh, to go to the, it's back to its old currency instead of the euro and so on. But then the Europeans, out of self-interest, they don't want to lose them. So therefore they had to pay anyway and somehow the conditions were somewhat changed. So they that's told, Abermas. Uh, they told everything, they can, they told the airport. Oh, yeah, all right. A anyway, yeah, but that's a long story. But, I mean, the socialists did make a difference. It was extended and whatever, and the rates were put down or whatever. So they still have to pay, and it's still austerity, and there's still a crisis, and, and so on. But uh, the Europeans don't want to... Uh, that is why vanishing Europe here. The danger is that England does not want to share the euro, that the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, they will have a, 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 some kind of... a. Uh, vote or whatever uh, soon if they want to stay in the European Union at all. So after all these national wars, after they butchered each other for centuries and centuries, they finally got together. And the critical theorists were, were somehow in, in, on the side of those people who uh, wanted to have Europe coming together, together with two friends of mine, which I mentioned already, Kogon, who wrote the SS state, and Dirks, who was the most honest journalist. If you find honest journalist, you know, you can have a hard time to find one. So he was one, and they fought for the European Union. So, and France and Germany then pushed it forward, and it came about. And now it is endangered because of these economic problems. And what Habermas is particularly afraid of is that democracy will become less and less. That means that the people on the bottom have less and less chance to co-determine uh, what their fate is like, to co-determine their economics and so on, that all of that will be dictated by these technocrats in Brussels. Okay, so here you see what he looks like, and um, I know him well, I visited him many times, and uh, so he is the most outstanding thinker which Europe has had in the last 30 years. So that is what we study here, right? 
the critical theory, not only individuals. Because there are sometimes people who take one individual, like Fromm, and have no idea that they belong to the Frankfurt School or to, to the critical theory. Okay? Okay, then I have one thing. Those, uh, who is in education? You are in education, right? Yep. And you have this already? I gave that to you already, right? Yeah. But uh, whoever doesn't have that yet, that is the, uh, which I have on my website, um, that is the educational theory of the critical theory. So a theory has in itself different disciplines. So the critical theory has in itself sociology, anthropology, psychoanalysis, and also education, right? This is, no, that's something else. Eh? Okay. Very good. You, you consider yourself uh, uh, as one uh, thinker of Frankfurt School? Hmm? You are from which generation of that? Frankfurt. From which what? You, uh, you uh, Yeah, you well, I'm from Frankfurt, yes. What, which generation? Second, third? Oh, generation? oh, I would be the second one, yeah. Okay. So I belong to the same generation like Habermas. Yeah, so in the first yeah, generation we will look at this. Yeah, maybe. Okay, very good. Now, let's, um, just before we come to all your questions, Let's take a uh, step by step. You all got wonderful grades the last time. You all are accumulating capital, and <laughs> it's wonderful to see this. Intellectual capital. <laughs> yes. Thanks to the God. Yes. <laughs> okay, so we are in our fourth now, fourth discourse, right? And we want to remember very shortly what we did the last time, and if we left anything out still the last time. So yep. that was our Question. third discourse. Um, you have the question the last time, you know, if these were real people, and so I tried to explain it a little bit, you know, this early group of three, Pollock and Horkheimer, yeah. and uh, they had this island of happiness uh, in which they began to do unfold their ideas. They represented their ideas in art form, in poetry, in essays, stories, and so on. Um, then we said something, we had a long discussion on ISIS here, um, and uh, there, you know, we somehow we went to so far to say that, you know, ISIS uh, are crazy or whatever, and we wanted to, uh, uh, to, you know, have a little bit more scientific approach to it, so we have to get all the facts, and then there is the question, you know, of bringing categories in. Um, since it is a religious group, we uh, talked about the dichotomy, dichotomy of the religion the secular, but this is not the main antagonism which we have in the critical theory of society. That is the main antagonism in the critical theory of religion, but not the critical theory of society. There it is the class antagonism, which is central, right, class. And this is so difficult in this country because they have hidden it, ideologically hidden it. It's supposed to be an equal society, and uh, then they have taken the race thing in order to cover up the class thing, as they did in fact in Germany as well. So it's very tricky here uh, to talk about class. You can even say that individuals are hurt by that when you do this, because they think right away, which class do I belong to? Which class do my parents belong to? When you go to Western, what class do you belong to? And, so on. and then it becomes really painful because every American is somehow in a competitive relationship to everybody else. And then when you talk about class, there begins the hierarchization, and the question is, where the hell do I belong now? You know, <laughs> I'm from the bottom of up. Yes. The working class feels offended or the, or the bourgeoisie? Well, we don't have much bourgeoisie here. <laughs> we have, uh, uh, we uh, have uh, one that is light, like my friend Light. He is the grandson of Abjan here. So here's the bourgeois. That's about. There are not too many bourgeois on campus. I mean, among the po I mean professors. The other one, the other than there is the the middle class, there is the upper class. So no, which, which let's which let's use bourgeoisie, and we use that word already. That's a French word, and that's important because in France the bourgeoisie, let's say middle class, you know, made that revolution. So they decapitated the clergy, they guillotined, you know, the nobility, and came into power. They had come into power already in England before, but they made it very theoretical. They had a real enlightenment where they produced constitutions like ours, you know, comes from there. 
So then you have this bourgeois country here, the most advanced bourgeois country ever. Uh, we had no nobility here whatsoever. Lord Baltimore was a nobleman, but he stayed only for three years. Canada had some nobility, Mexico had some nobility, but this is a purely bourgeois country. And so what, what we have in Western, most professors there are from a working class background. Their fathers were blacksmiths or what in Chicago and so on, and, uh, and they made it. Um, some, when they are older, they had the GI Bill. Oh, they were soldiers in the Second World War, and then they got the GI Bill, and then they could study. My doctor here was a GI Bill guy, you know, most of They were lifted out. They, their fathers were working for the paper mills. They had 12 or whatever paper mills here. And then the sons to the GI Bill could make it. So um, in the department, we had one who had the Honors College, uh, um, head of the Honors College for a long time from Chicago. Uh, he was a bourgeois type. But then the students, too. There may be a few, but it's hard to see, you know. So, I mean, if, if those who should benefit from the theory feel offended by it as, as middle class, yeah. then it's not really... Hitting. Well, they come from the working class and they want to go into the middle class. So, when you go to Western, you can get into middle management. The Saudi uh, brothers and sisters there, they, I told you already what the reason is for them to be here. The, the, the kings have enough people for the state organization, Saudis, but they have a lot of Europeans who work in civil society, in the oil companies and so on. They want to replace them by, uh, by those who study here. So, um, so you can get here from, from the working class into the middle management or so. And then you could say you are low middle class or middle middle class or something, but you don't go into the upper bourgeoisie. So the upper bourgeoisie would be what Bernie called it today, there that is uh, half a percent who own 50 percent of the country's wealth. <laughs> so you never see them. But as long as you stay here, you will never see a higher bourgeois. Uh, Kalamazoo has no high bourgeoisie. They only have a high middle bourgeoisie, like the Kennedys, but not even like the Kennedys. The difference between bourgeois and uh, nobles is that nobles get it from their father, bourgeois get it from their money, or what's the difference? Well, I mean, it depends now. The nobility, so they were originally feudal lords. That means they got their property from the king for military services, which they did. And they had serfs. So the feudal lord has a serf. The feudal lord did his own fighting. The serf only carried his shield and his sword. And the king, uh, the nobleman went into the battle and fought, opposite to the bourgeois who stays at home, makes the profit, and sends his workers to the front to die, and he makes the profit of them. So they are, and then the property, even when there is no feudalism anymore, and the feudal lord becomes more independent from the king, it is still it is stable, it's static property, so it's not exchangeable. He cannot sell it really. So, uh, so therefore there are limits to it. But you have, you know, the slaves and the slaveholders, you have the feudal lords and the serfs, and you have the capitalists and the wage laborers. The, the king can, you mean the king can sell it, or who can? can well, it's the question. Originally, the king gave the property, all the property was the, to, belonged to the king. Yeah. He gave it to his lords. The lords served him when he needed an army. All these knights came and helped him to fight and so on. But then you have later on the nobility may free itself. In Russia it was a little bit different. So it's in every country may be a little bit different. But you see there is a whole system with the feudal lord and, and nobility and the king and the nobility and so on. Now they were overthrown by the bourgeoisie. See the bourgeoisie is very aggressive, right? They invented the guillotine. Dr. Guillotine, you know, they invented the guillotine where they could cut the heads off faster. That's what they did in Paris, right? Tara. So there is not only the ISIS tower, the religious tower, there is also the bourgeois political tower, you know, where they bomb people out of the, into the Stone Age. Okay, so, uh, okay, so that's what we, we try to say, you know, what, uh, um, that, that this has something to do with what is important for the critical theory of religion, which we are not so much concerned with here. Namely, that through this antagonism between the religion and the secular, and let's th make it concrete now what it means to be secular and enlightened. You do not believe in angels, right? Angel Gabriel came to Mohammed. There is no angel. There you see the whole problem already. Angel, the same angel Gabriel came to Mary. 
to announce the spirit of Jesus, you know. There is no angel, right? There are no miracles. When, when Joshua marched to the Jordan to the east. Who says that? Hmm? Who says that? Good one. Who? The enlightened. Good one. The enlightened. Good one. Enlightenment, right? Because what we have to get in our brain here is not only then what the religions teach, but also what the enlightenment is, what this country is, you know? And you hear it every day. It was this morning again, you know, where uh, somebody, an evangelist, you know, talks to, against homosexuality and the conflict he has now with the new legislation and so on. And so it's a daily culture war going on, right? Because they are positivists. 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 No, no that, that is another complicated thing which we may go into it. That means the enlightenment which was genuine in the beginning. But let me just make that point now. When you are an enlightener, you don't believe in miracles. So when you read that the angel came to Mohammed, you cannot accept this because there are no angels, right? There's all the difficulties already. When you read the New Testament, the angel Gabriel came to Mary, you are the, uh, uh, blessed by, by God, and so on and so on. There is no angel, right? And then miracles. Mo not Moses, but Joshua marches near Jericho across the Jordan. The Jordan stands still. The water stops up there, and they all march through. Try put twelve stones into the middle, then they walk up with another twelve stones on the other side before they storm Canaan, and 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 then when they are all over with the ark and the priests, the water comes back. You no, know, when when you are enlightened, you are uh, you cannot accept this. See, that is how deep it goes. You know. People think that Americans, you know, wash that over because they neither know what the religion says nor do they know what the Enlightenment is where they are coming from. So, or Jericho, you know, that's where they crossed the Jordan. So that's where the water stood still. Then Joshua uh, uh, goes around Jericho in order to take it. Before that, he had already sent uh, spies into Jericho. And they sent it to a prostitute who lived high on the wall of Jericho. And then later on, they stormed Jericho, and by blowing the horn, the wall falls down of Jericho. Unfortunately, Jericho is the oldest city which we know. It is 6,000 years old. The walls had already crashed 2,000 years before Joshua came. So there you have it, right? To be enlightened, has, you have a hard time to be religious. But it's interesting that the genuine enlightenment were emphasizing that Judaism was a slave religion because of all the statutes and laws and all this, and Christianity is then the moral religion. And moral religion means the Sermon on the Mount. So, and then the enlightenment said, does religion make people more. And even in light of the day sees the priest abusing the children and so on. A priest who has celebrated the Mass every day for 20 years. Then he said, this statutory religion does not make people moral. It is, in fact, they make them even more immoral because they forgive their sins. And they say, you know, okay, your sins is you know, it's forgiven and so on. So thereby they even contribute to the immorality of people. You know. Today my daughter, I just told about it, my daughter wrote me and sent me an article by a capitalist who built 20 corporations and so on, and now he has discovered that if we give $15 minimum wage, that this is a good thing for business, because these workers who get the $50 go out and buy stuff again. Then they have to hire new people and make enormous profits. And I said, I'm so happy when the capitalist makes this step forward in morality. But it was utter irony, because Keynes, Lord Keynes, and Hitler, and Ford, you know, had the same principle. That means pump money into civil society, you know, for social issues, and then these people will right away come and go to the stores and buy it again. Of course it's good for the whole thing. Henry Ford gave one dollar per hour for the workers here, they took the money and bought their own damn T-model. 
see, these capitalists here are so, so far back behind the whole thing. They fight for 30 years without the minimum wage. We have to fire people and so on. It's just as if you were in a capitalistic kindergarten. <laughs> because it was all known 100 years ago. Hitler did it in Germany, Ford did it here and so on. And now they come and suddenly discover this, you know. Not only is their morality on, on the lowest level, but their intellectuality is on the same level. They don't even know what's good for their business. But what, what makes, again, what makes religion uh, so immoral? I mean, or what, where did this doctrine come from? No, no, the, the, uh, the enlighteners yeah. made a difference between Judaism and Christianity. Mm -hmm. And they said Jesus came and brought the uh, Sermon on the Mount. You cannot kill. Even when you say to somebody, you terrorist, you have already killed him. Or you cannot commit adultery. Well, already when you look uh, with desire or lust at a woman, you have already committed your, your thing and so on. Okay, or or love your, system. don't only love your neighbor, love your enemy and so on. Mm -hmm. So this is morality. Yeah. Compared with this morality, the Jewish religion is statutory. That means uh, you have to fulfill these ceremonial laws. You have to have two sacrifices a day. You, on Sabbath, you cannot carry anything because God rested on the Sabbath. Therefore, you cannot make ten steps on Sabbath. And so we just discussed it this morning with the rabbi. So this external type of religion, you know, where you are practically enslaved by these statutes, you know, all the time you have to see, you know, do I carry this so far now on Sabbath or not? And so in that, uh, instead of that, all that is thrown back and you have now a religion of morality. So, but that means then that you have to sell your property um, to the poor and so on. That money is tainted, which you have not worked for. Because if you have money in your pocket, which you have not worked for, then it's either a present or you took it from somebody who worked for it and didn't get it, and you got it and you didn't work for it. That's the whole capitalistic system. So enlightenment spoiled the religion. Hmm? Enlightenment spoiled the religion. No, the first enlighteners, where there was genuine enlightenment, were not so hostile against religion. Yeah. So this is where we come to Marx again, right, and Freud again. Marx was not against religion. Marx was against the abuse of religion by the bourgeoisie. But, as we said, your bourgeois teachers think that bourgeois religion is the only religion there is. And so if somebody attacks the wrong religion, they think he is against religion. In reality, Marx compared the Sermon on the Mount with the behavior of the Anglicans and the Catholics in London. He said you do the exact opposite of what the Sermon on the Mount says. That's what they said. But what, in particularly in the Soviet Union, for example? What? In the Soviet Union, those who were, um, I mean, uh, Marxists, they didn't give any model where they respect any type of religion, no. They eliminated all types of religion. They wanted a pure atheist society, as if really they believe that the only religion exists is the bourgeois one. So they are the ones... That is that's part of it, but Why? we have uh, Katya here, you know, who was in my household for three years. Katya grew up in the Soviet Union. And she is very skeptical about, you know, what was done in, in Russia about religion. Because the, Stalin, for instance, posed, put up, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, not only the Archbishop of Moscow, but what is it, the highest? Uh, pa the Patriarch, yeah. The Patriarch uh, of Moscow, and so on. He, uh, you know, there were changes when the war started. He allowed the farmers to take the icons out of the garden again. And uh, so that may be a bourgeois abuse, even of religion, in the same way. That's true. They, yeah. they uh, at a particular t time, small time, they use the religion for some political purpose. Like the bourgeoisie does, yeah, right. I yeah. mean, the Soviet Union. Yeah, the Soviet whole Union. thing was sharp against any type of religion. Okay, before we do that, we, let's not jump from what we just tried to work through there, because you said something about positivism, right? And positivism is a perversion of the Enlightenment. So we have to see what kind of Enlightenment was there before it became perverted. So it started in Germany, in Berlin. So they were Enlighteners in Berlin. For instance, Moses Mendelssohn was a Jewish Enlightener in Berlin. And then there were Enlighteners in the periphery, which was, for instance, Goethe and Schiller 
and uh, and Schelling and uh, and Fichte and Hegel and so on. So the Enlightenment split right in the beginning already, not so much in France but in Germany. The Enlighteners in the center of Berlin, they were uh, worked on the level of analytical understanding. That's what you do in all the sciences here, and they were concerned only with finite things. You know, the mind was limited. It could not go beyond the finite thing, so you couldn't study religion or whatever. So, um, and then the others, they walked on the level of dialectical reason, and they could transcend the finite world. And the people in Berlin, they shouted and screamed at the others out there, and uh, uh, criticized them and so on. So there was this split between, and out of this split developed the dialectic of enlightenment, and then. So Hegel was the one who discovered the dialectic of enlightenment 100 years before Horkheimer and Adorno. And then we come to that famous book, The Dialectic of Enlightenment, which Horkheimer and Adorno wrote in Los Angeles, and which has just been re-edited again to the German. Hmm? They ordered the German copy of it. Yeah, they wrote it in German. I, I ordered it. I, I he ordered it, he bought it. Oh, you bought it. Okay, okay, very good. In German. So you can read it in German. Good, very good. Very good. Okay. So that is very important now, the dialectic of enlightenment. Because the Frankfurt School people are enlighteners who are critical of what happened to the enlightenment. Because the enlightenment developed its own inner contradiction. That means the enlightenment was originally to free people from their fears and to make them into masters of their faith. But the Enlightenment sometimes increased the fears and also enslaved people again. So the critical theories are critics of the dialectic of Enlightenment, that something went wrong with the Enlightenment. And what was wrong with it started already in Berlin in the, in the 18th century and developed further and further. So, um, another thing, so another thing would be about positivism now. More precisely, Kant, August Kant, is the father of positivism. So he came about after the bourgeoisie had won its victory, after all the clergy was killed or under control, after all the nobility had been killed or were under control. Then, when they were in power now, they didn't want to have revolutionary thinking anymore now. They wanted to have stability. And so now comes the right and the left, the Hegelian right and the left, and Kant is on the right. So they emphasize now the conservative content, and the left, that is then Marx and so on, emphasize the dialectical, the critical form. That is the controversy then intellectually, which goes on up to today. So our university, sociology, department, anthropology, is all Kant. It's all positivistic. You have not a trace of dialectical or critical thinking or whatever. When they say critical thinking, they mean notions, judgments, conclusions, you know, the, the, the logical rules or whatever, but it has nothing to do with critique of any kind whatsoever. That is the fault of free and general studies that we have these courses, you know, there is no critique whatsoever in it. So, but there is a reason for it, you know. The reason why we repress dialectics in this country, that was during the Great Depression was we did not want people to think in opposites. Because then they would have said, look, on one side there of, of, the, of the university, there are these million dollar homes, you know, and on the other side of the railroad station, you have those shacks there, where people have no income and whatever, no music, no art, no philosophy, no religion, and whatever, you know. So that means, not only was now the economy in bad shape, broke down the capitalist like 2008, and so but now people would think suddenly dialectically and would say, how happened that, that happened? So on our university, you can write when you are a PhD is a candidate, you can write about the North Side. <laughs> you can also write about those big homes with police watchmen and so on. But you cannot write about both of them and how they are connected. That on one side, the wealth is inherited, and on the other side, the poverty is inherited because the surplus value flows continually from one side to the other. And that's for a whole century already. And then, you know, about race now. The race issue is really a class issue because it's that race which appears suddenly on the north side. 
and again and again and again, right? But it is not a race problem, it's a class problem. If they are white or black or green or yellow or whatever, it does not matter at all. The capitalist is completely indifferent to race. The capitalist is not a racist. He wants to have profit from everybody, no matter what, what color they have. And the cheaper they are, the better it is. Okay, so this, uh, so this is part of the, um, so Kant invented the name sociology, and uh, he also invented the name positivism. And so what you study in the sociology department, or the religion department, or whatever, that is a positivistic religiology, or a positivistic sociology, or a positivistic anthropology, and so on. What the critical theory does then is a critical sociology or a dialectical sociology. Marx didn't want to have the name at all because of Kant. So, or in other words now, the bourgeoisie, the third estate, made its revolution. It had its theory. By the way, this Enlightenment theory spread also into the nobility, whatever was left of it. There were noble men who worked on the constitutions. You know, they helped the bourgeoisie. And this is important. That means a revolution can never be made by the ones who suffer, because they have no education. They are students, so they wouldn't even know how, what the system is like or where they should start. In the 60s, you know, when the students rebelled and threw buses over and here on the campus too, I was their spokesman here, so uh, they had no idea where they were. And what I told them in the class all the time, I said, you have to study where you are, otherwise you don't know, you know, what button you have to push, and then you sacrifice yourself for nothing, you know. And they came here, and then when the CIA came, or whatever, the FBI, then they were running, they were forced in the back, they were running through the forest, and then the FBI behind them, and they had their big bellies there, they couldn't run very well, and so they couldn't catch them. So they came back, and I said, but why do you run after those children, you know, get to the mafia? We have the mafia here from Chicago and Detroit, they're shooting at each other sometimes. To catch them, you know, they have bellies too, and you don't have to run so fast. <laughs> so then the judges, you know, ordered the FBI out, so they were sitting outside the, in the cars for weeks and weeks and weeks, and terrorized my wife and, and my children. So, so this, um, so that is about the, the right wing and left wing and the intellectual thing, the positivism. What you study, you see, because when we study critical theory, we include ourselves into the whole thing, right? We will right away know we don't keep ourselves out or above it or whatever. We include ourselves. That is our type of thinking. And the other type of thinking we have replaced. So you said Marx didn't want, want to use positivism because it came from Kant? Right, yeah. Okay. No, because not from Kant, but no, from Kant. Kant, right? Kant, I mean yeah, not, not Kant. So in Kant, you have the greatest enlightener in Kant. So if you want to read what the, what the bourgeois, the greatness of the bourgeois enlightenment, then read Kant, right? But then also the others, Goethe and Schiller and so on and so on. And you can also read the others who are responsible for the dialectic of enlightenment, who were in the center of Berlin. So the center of Berlin is really the source of the dialectic of enlightenment, and the genuine enlightenment went up outside of, uh, of Berlin, where you have all these Kant there in the northeast and, and so on and so on. But I thought this Kant, he he founded the positivism, not, not dialectic. Not Kant, Kant. I mean Kant. Yeah. Kant founded positivism, not uh, dialectic. No, no, no. He was completely undialectic. Oh. So all bourgeois scholars are undialectic. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. he didn't. He didn't. Bachofen, for instance. He didn't found out this 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 uh, term dialectic. Right? Yeah. He didn't found it out. He didn't find it. He didn't. Who? Emmanuel Kant. Kant? Kant? No, no, Kant. So Kant, 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 yeah, I Kant, Kant know, didn't figure that. Yeah, yeah. But Marx didn't. So Marx didn't want to use dialectic because of whom? Kant, right? No, 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 no. no. Marx is a dialectician. Kant is not a dialectician. So, okay, think right and left, right? Yeah. So you are on the right. We are on the right. This university is on the right. The whole country is on the right. Mm -hmm. It's so far on the right that you cannot even see the left. Okay, but, but there are people on the left, but on the right, and then there are people in the middle, too, between the two. So, the left is dialectical, the right is positivistic. But, another thing, now, how did this court, how did that come about? So, when we think of the critical theory, we have not only think of thought, the thoughts are always connected with real developments in the society. So, since the bourgeoisie 
did these constitutions and all that, only for their own interests, and excluded other people. The excluded then began to rebel. Excluded was, of course, the clergy. Excluded were the nobility, but they decimated them. But they were the masses of people who were not bourgeoisie or low bourgeoisie, the working class. And this working class felt excluded. So already by 1831, the first commune rebellion in Paris, 1871, another commune rebellion. And how far that goes? In 1870, the Germans conquered Paris. The bourgeoisie in Paris made a deal with the Prussians in order to fight their own commune. That means the class struggle is much more important than the international struggle. The Germans are in Paris. They coronate their king. And the French bourgeoisie makes a deal with the conquerors in order to repress their own bourgeoisie, their own workers, their own street cleaners, and whatever it is. So that is the class thing, right? And here it is so difficult to see, not in England. When you are in England, everybody knows which class he belongs to. Here they don't. They think when they suddenly have a big uh, Cadillac standing in front of the house in, in the on the north side, they think they belong to the other class. In our country, it's very clear. Also. Hmm? Everybody knows it. Everybody knows it. Yeah. So it's everywhere except here. So that means the ideology has taken over here, and it will be a horrible awakening when that becomes clear. And and Bernie, you know, is one step in this. Don't marry from each other. In life, hmm? they don't marry from each other between each other. Yeah. No, you have, no you have to be from the same. Yeah. A girl must be from the same. Oh yeah, 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 right, yeah. But you see, here they do marry in between the classes, but it doesn't hold, it doesn't, you know. And they find out, so they, they, so let's see, girls and boys, you know, they're not used to class thinking. So somebody from a higher class marries a lower class, and then they find out, you know, the, the one from the lower class never traveled anywhere, did not go to the university, does not read the newspaper, doesn't read any book, and so on and so on. And then the tensions become bigger and bigger, you know, and uh, hell breaks loose. It's much better to know, you know, that when you are in one class, then your partner has traveled as you have traveled, you went to the same school, it's suited the church, it's a this country club, because the whole cl system is, uh, is uh, constructed according to class. So if you go to a working class country club, they are working class country clubs. Or you can go to a working class church, or, or an upper class church. So, let's see, in some, uh, some usually Episcopalians, of the upper classes. Sometimes you can find the Catholics, it depends too, they have moved up a little bit in the world. So, so, but it goes through the whole thing. And there is an unbelievable blindness for all of this. But let me say, 1831, 1848, you know, there's another one in, in Frankfurt, you know, where the, the Germans finally wanted to make their bourgeois revolution. They were a little bit back. See, Russia was furthest back. Then the Germans were back. The French were ahead. And the head of the French were the British. So the bourgeoisie is, you know, we're not all on the same level. That they were so far back in Russia was a horrible thing for the future, you know. So, and that the Germans were so far back also. So then the, in Germany, the Marx traveled to Frankfurt in 1848. And, uh, but the German nobility, the German bourgeoisie, instead of uniting themselves with the proletariat, to the disappointment of Marx, united themselves with the nobility. So the Germans had no bourgeois revolution, and then they got a petit bourgeois revolution with Hitler. See, all what you have on the left of the National Assembly in Paris breaks out in Nazism in, in Germany, in a horrible way. Like, when you, when you didn't live your teenage time right, you may get it when you're 60, you know, the whole thing breaks loose. That happened to the Germans. So, but 1848, so there we have this class thing. And then 1917, you know, in Hamburg, the rebellion where the working class, the Marines, and so on. And you have two uh, socialistic revolutions in Munich. And then you have a fascist revolution in Munich, a counter revolution in Munich. So that's also the fascists are the counter revolutionaries, right? The socialists are the revolutionaries. 1989 was a counter revolution. So I just wrote in Croatia. I said, unfortunately, we have this counter-revolution of 1989, stimulated by the Vatican and by Germany, 
and by the CIA. That's a counter-revolution. And they say, not a counter-revolution. If you had a revolution, and you counter it, and you present the same conditions which you had before the revolution, that is a counter-revolution against according to all rules of law. You mean in, in, in Russia or in East Germany? That, um, uh, everywhere. I mean, 1989 was a counter-revolution which went through the whole territory. The, the whole fall? Full wall, the full of the wall. Yeah, the wall. So it was the breakthrough of uh, nationalism, which even the CIA had not speculated so on. The Russians to, neither. Uh, to reconcile Germany again. Huh? It was, I mean, it was a good thing to reconcile Germany again. Well, I mean, even if we don't look, at it was if we don't, if we don't look at this uh, economical or yeah, I mean, you, you can always cover economic things up by nationalism. So then, you, if you blow that national thing, you know, but the uh, the West Germany, you know, uh, take, took over East Germany. You know that it was yeah, unconstitutional. They, need, they needed that economically. They needed You're right. That. But the German constitution said, and I was part of it when it was when it was done, the German constitution said if there is a reunion, then there should be a national assembly and an election in both parts, and people should have a constitutional assembly to make up a new constitution. Instead of that, they just took it over. Stole all the professorships, you know stole all the, the big estates with the cows and, and so on and so on. The Danish came in, the Swedes, and, and the workers on these big uh, collective farms, they thought, wow, well, we get better salary. They just sold it, killed the cows, and left everything laying there. And people were unemployed. They just wanted to kill the, the competition. The WERF the in, 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 uh, in East Germany who built these beautiful ships, you know, particularly for the Russians. They were just a competition to those in England and Belgium and so on, so they just closed them up. And I was there when it happened, you know, it was horrifying. And the Rostock and... Rostock, yeah, the Rostock, the, the work there, yeah, the, uh, I was there, I saw the workers fired and getting drunk and the marriages destroyed and so on. I lived there. Just awful. Yeah, I lived there. Yeah. I, I, I saw it there, you know, so yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so where are we? We just want to finish up there what we did the last time. We had this whole discussion on ISIS. We talked about the secular and religious antagonism and we we come back sometimes. We said that this brings a split, you know, in the, for the religious people, uh, which uh, dissolves their, their, their substance. I saw the rabbi today again with my class, and he is a liberal rabbi. I mean, there's a left of Judaism. I mean, the, the rabbis in Jerusalem, you know, they are right. They would never accept his ordination, you know, or the ordination even of Bivak or whatever, because the Bivak is more left. But mm -hmm. the more they are opening up, you know, to modernity, the less is there. You know, it's all gone. When I said, you know, Yahweh speaks to Moses, Yahweh speaks to Joshua, and so on, uh, and he says things which are forever, and now what power, who gives you the power to undo whatever Yahweh said? And so there's no answer whatsoever. He just said, well, you cannot live with it anymore. <laughs> and then that's, uh, I mean, when you look at the 630 mitzvot, you know, for Maimonides, where it says, you know, the high priest should marry, should marry a virgin, there is no high priest since 70, and the virgins were running out of virgins too. So, <laughs> therefore, <laughs> nothing is there anymore, you know. I mean, one doesn't even know on, on what this whole thing is resting, except of barbecues or having hamburger days or whatever, some social events. It's just pitiful. Okay. So, nevertheless, then we have, uh, what else did we do? We, we emphasized particularly with ice grievances, you know, as a solution. Uh, what do these? What does the Islamic Brotherhood want? What does Hezbollah want? What does Hamas want? Not all their killing, their taking children as as child shields and so on. This is all stupid propaganda stuff. You know, it's black propaganda, uh, which the British invented in the First World War and so on. So it should be over all this. A much better question would be, what does Hamas want? What does you know? So maybe do they want to have the two state thing? I mentioned this morning with the rabbi, the Labour Party in the Knesset just said it would be nice to have a two-state solution, but there will be no state solution. It, it, it just cannot be done in so on and so on. The rabbi added, because there's ISIS, suddenly there's ISIS. Because of ISIS, they cannot have a two-state solution. So, I mean, it's one lie after the other, you know. And one cannot say, I mean, we always have to be friendly and loving, and, and the rabbi is our friend and you know we are happy that we can talk with him but uh, uh, so it has to be loving and, and so on and so on but it is, it is just that sometimes it's just horrifying okay so um, but we don't want to go into this so it's just want to see so grievances what what does ISIS want no, so 
Does ISIS want us to be out of the country? Probably, you know. So, so we have to ask ourselves, what the hell are we doing there? We lost, uh, we lost the war in, in Afghanistan. We lost the war in, in, in Iraq, etc. So what the hell are we doing there? We did this for 14 years now. We bombed them, we killed them, and so on. And there are more of them now than they were there. They, they multiply, like the insects under atomic radiation. They are just getting bigger all the time. So to do the same thing and expect different results is the definition of insanity. It's insanity to go on with what did not work and what was even counterproductive. So therefore, you know, to ask, so why not getting out? Why can't we get out? Well, we we need the oil or whatever. But we went, we were thrown out of Vietnam, and now we get rubber from Vietnam. One can trade, you know. Why can't we leave that what belongs to those people and say, let's trade? We will buy your. We don't have to own. Now we do own two thirds of the oil companies in Iraq. And what are we doing now? We are bombing them to pieces because they are the source of income for ISIS. This is all not normal, you know, it's not normal. So, um, so let's ask them and then say, you know, maybe we have to tell them we cannot leave because we have to have the oil. I mean, then at least we know what it's all about, you know. We could wish the same thing with capitalism. Hmm? I mean, we could reach the same thing that they do with the war. If we just uh, treat, as you said, with capitalism, they can get also the same things from the people. Right? I don't understand it now. They I mean, should be capitalist, they go. I mean, uh, now they use war to get yeah, to right. get this war. Okay, so we, what we they say. Could, they could use capitalism mm. to do the same Well, trade, you know, trade, yeah, trade, yeah. I mean. Yeah. I mean yeah, even they could even cheat them in trade, you know. <laughs> they could, uh, you know, yeah, they could the get the, the oil price down by pumping up yeah. more here from these stuff that they have developed here now. So yes, but it would be killing. better. Yeah. It would be more rational than killing and then destroying your own oil wells. It's the same thing with Hitler. You know, the, the liberals and fascists. The truth of the is, you know, what what they did. They, Hitler marched into the Caucasus and then burned up all these oil wells in spite of the fact that oil they were burned up already. Be, and he needed the oil for his tanks, but he destroyed them, and then he marched back to Stalingrad and was beaten. So it is, it is not a healthy way of thinking. Right? So, uh, so, but that was one thing which we had, you know, to ask for the grievances in God's name, and that would be, for Christians particularly, you know, of loving your enemy. What does that mean? Loving your enemy means at least that you take him as a human being and not as an insect or a cancer or something like that. But these are people who have a language. You can talk with them or listen to them what the hell they want. And why do they attract so many of their own people here, particularly the younger ones? It's the same thing which Bernie attracts. All these young people are also attracted by ISIS. So what is the metaphysical emptiness which ISIS is filling? Fortunately or whatever it is, it, they do, they do. People go there not only to get married, they go there in order to die. So uh, this, uh, that is what our core word there, grievances. Um, if we uh, say we cannot fulfill, so if they say, you know, the borders, the borders are not right. Who made the borders between Syria and, uh, and so on? The British did. And the British have this theoretical mind, you know, this analytical mind, so they made straight lines. They're always straight lines, and it does not matter who lives in those straight lines, you know. No matter which tribe it is or whatever, they just made lines. And they said, well, here's where Syria ends, and here is where Iraq begins. And, and there was no, no precedence for the whole thing, and so on. It was just for them to control the territory better. That was the reason why they made these lines. So, if their grievance is these lines which the colonialists made were unnatural lines, you know, go along a river in God's name, or include a desert, or whatever, you know. But they were continue, completely artificial in order to promote the domination interest and exploitation interests of the French and the British, and, and so on. So uh, I think it, it could have as a starting point. And then one could still say, okay, you want this from us, but we cannot do this. Today, or it was in Somalia or whatever, they put a bomb again under a seat of an airliner. Thanks to the guard, the guy was only 12, uh, whatever, 
2,000 feet high, so otherwise the whole thing would have blown up. And it was in a seat right above the wing, and you know the gas lid is all in the wing. So if it had gone through that gas lid, the whole thing would have blown up. So so I don't know. If I think it was in Somalia. Yeah, yeah right. So and then that will come sooner or later. It will come here again when they can put that under a seat in Somalia. They can put it under a seat here too. So um, this is not a way to do this. Therefore, this question has to be asked. To love the enemy means to take him seriously as a human being with whom I disagree, you know, or whatever. But I have to know what in God's name he wants and not to kill him before he says what he wants. So um, if, if, he's, if he says, you know, we want to uh, uh, get rid of your enlightenment and we want to take you back into the Middle Ages, then we have to say, no, there's not a chance. There's not a chance that we will go to Sharia law or the book Leviticus or whatever. We are happy that we have the freedom of speech and, and so on and so on. But whatever little freedoms we have, that we have a, a formal trans transaction or transition of power between one bourgeois party and the other bourgeois party, it's little enough, but we are happy that we have it and we don't want to go back and we don't want to have a king neither or whatever. So uh, we will not, if they say uh, agree with this, we will say this is where we cannot negotiate. We will not give up the bourgeois enlightenment. We will not give up the Marxist enlightenment. We will not give up the Freudian enlightenment. We will not give up the, the scientific enlightenment, and so on, or whatever enlightenment we have. So, and there are certain limits. Sometimes people agree to disagree. That's another possibility. We could agree to disagree with ISIS and the hundreds of other subgroups of the of the Islamic Brotherhood, which are there along the whole African coast and up to Turkey. That is the human way to do it. We have apes cannot talk, we can talk with each other. I think some of them, we can convince some of them. I don't know if we can convince them. The first step would be, what are your grievances? If, we say, if they say, look, you humiliated us for centuries and so on. Did we humiliate them? Yes, we humiliated them. So we are very sorry. Can that be made good, this humiliation? Maybe not. Then we can say we would like to make it good, but not, you know. The British Air Force went to Africa, as I said, you know, to Libya and so on, and bombed the sheikhs' tents with their children and so on, as if they were shooting pheasants or doves or whatever, just for pleasure. That was the first bombing runs which they made on African uh, Muslims in the, in the desert and so on. So these are horrible things, and they cannot be made good, you know. The Germans had to make good things with the, with the Israelis, with, not the Israelis, the Jews, you know. But they paid billions of marks and so on. Have they really made it good, you know? It's quite questionable. If you look at one Jewish family, one Jewish woman, whom I took to the air shelter where she was transported away, you know. No price can be paid No, cannot be paid off. But the Germans did... But they, and the Merkel, you know, said, I told you the story, when the Mufti story came up with Netanyahu, we take the responsibility for the whole thing. And that's the right thing to do. I know when I was in Israel, you know, there are taxi guys, the German came suddenly, you know, over the weekend and said, here's your Mercedes, you know, take the Mercedes, give me Mercedes. So they're individual Germans who did something good and so on. But whatever is done when you think, even if they didn't have gas them, even if they didn't gas them, to put them together like animals, to transport them on this thing, to work them to death, you know, with a V number one, V number two, they were used as labor, slave labor, and so on. All these are horrible crimes. Even if you take Cyclone B out, like the, uh, uh, the you know, deniers uh, say, and so on, or there's the expert for executions, and so on, Cyclone B cannot be found, or there are not enough uh, bathtubs to, to kill him. So even if they take that out, it still remains an unbelievable crime. So which which cannot be made good. But at least you see it's a human way to approach it. We can then say we colonized you for two hundred years, we took all your resources, we used your cheap labor and so on. Um, with our black people here, you know, what if they come and say they want to have the surplus value back? It's not true that they were not paid anything. Slaves are also paid something. The housing is paid, their clothing is paid, you know. The medical care is paid. The slaveholders did pay for them, but they made a horrendous uh, with the cotton and so a horrendous profit. And so, does it have to be paid back in some way? They could come.
come, you know. They could take the Jewish people as an example. But you know, in the end, the workers could come. The workers whose surplus value has been stolen here, who had no health insurance, who had no social security, for two, three centuries of primitive capital accumulation now, they all could come and say, pay back, you know. So, but now in this specific case, uh, that was one of our core ideas, and I think it is still valid, you know. Uh, these many Al Qaeda and so on, all these groups, you know, and and they do say something, but then it is a hostile way. They say it there, we talk here. There is no talk. No, just say it normally, you know, and then we can say it cannot be done, or we could do this and this, you know, and so on. But you have to do this and this too. You have to stop cutting heads off, and and so on, or persecuting the Christians, or your own people and so on so there must be a giving back and forth and so on you know, that would be the human way this as it is done now can only worsen the situation because now you have to wipe them out and they say it even we have to wipe ISIS out what do you do that 30,000 people or 60,000 people you want to kill them all or whatever so this is how this eye for eye tooth for tooth can be resolved you have to annihilate one side that is why the, why the Hitlers wanted to annihilate the Jews you know and to make sure that nobody, they had a whole sterilization program, that no next generation is growing up, because they could revenge their fathers. But, I mean, this is not a way out, neither, you know. Mm -hmm. Mahatma Gandhi said, you know, eye for eye makes all people blind in the end. It's an, an insane type of a way. So we could even say to each other, you know, look, this is insane. It doesn't go that way. So then we bomb to pieces in Raqqa there, then they go to Libya. Suddenly you have 30,000 in Libya of them, which is much closer to Europe. It's just because Sicily, it's Italy. It's where Hitler and Rommel and all these people fought all the time. So, um, this, uh, okay, so that's critical theory, right? Then we have something, we talked about defense of Islam. We have to take that seriously. Islam is a great world religion. Muhammad was a prophet. Look at this stupidity again. Christians said, and, and the Jews go on to saying that, that Mohammed was not a prophet. Why not? Because he was polygamic. He started out with one woman, then he had several, then he had some widows, and sometimes it was nine, then he refused to begin to four, and then he had only one with whom he died. But all the prophets and all the kings of Israel were polygamic. Are there therefore no prophets because they were polygamic? What kind of a stupid thing that is? But you have it inside of religion too. The Catholics said, for 400 years, Luther made the Reformation because he wanted to get married. <laughs> he married a nun who was a refugee and whom he didn't like because she was a can, can, she was aggressive. Cantankerous. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he was. And so finally he married her. And it was, it was okay. They had five children. And so but he did not make the Reformation in 1517, which is next year. Um, th in order to get mad. It was the other way around. He made the Reformation and then he made a statement that forced celibacy was some kind of a good work which would never get your justification. That you could only be justified by the suffering of Jesus and not by good works like um, fasting or celibacy or any of these things. So it was not even, you know, the celibacy was not held. I mean, at that time, there were hundreds of pastors who lived with concubines, and many of them were slaughtered by the Inquisition and so on. So it was not the abuses, as we have them today, to all over the place, you know. But it was a theological thing, a theological thing. How are you justified? And to live in celibacy is not a way to be justified. And to fasting, or to crawl up the staircases in Rome, you know, Whereas until your legs are bloody and so on, this is not the way how you how you are justified, you know. And there was there was a spiritual revolution, you know. It was the saintly character of this guy. But now you know, for four hundred years until my doctor father, who was a fascist, wrote a Luther book which was halfway adequate. And that what fascinated me before I knew what he did as a fascist, because he finally destroyed some of these Catholic prejudices after 400 years so that some justice would be done.
so this justice has to be done to Muhammad as well, and so on. So he is a prophet. And when they, you know, we, this is what we do next week, or this week, um, that we say the Judeo-Christian Islamic values. It is, it is the, the uh, Abrahamic faith community with the same ethos in it, fundamentally, in, in all of them. So from now on, we always said Judeo-Christian values. It's Judeo-Christian Islamic values. It is the same faith community. So if we could, that would help too, you know, with ISIS. And so we are not so far away as they may think, you know. Rudy, it's uh, <coughs> almost 8 o'clock. Should we take a break? Yeah, okay. Let me just go through this here. What else? So we have to talk about the suffering, you know, of the Islamic people and the colonization. And um, then we also talked about experience and information on one side and then judgment, notion, conclusion on the other side. So Bernie said that recently. He said Clinton has experience but you also need judgment. And judgment means, you know, that she voted for the Iraq war, but she did not, that she initiated the war in Libya, uh, which, which was, no, it's not that thing where the ambassador was killed. The real problem with her is that she had no judgment and went with the British and the French together and bombed this whole territory. Broke the deal with Gaddafi, they gave him protection with his trucks, and so then they bombed him to pieces and put him into a tunnel, and then they torture him to death, and so on. Well, they didn't do it, others did it for them. Young Muslims did it. And so there, you know, the, the Ummah has to have a court where those people, by the Sharia law, are sentenced. Because to kill a man who had stopped fighting is against the Sharia law. Yeah. And we don't even have to do to, 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 to Den Haag or whatever, to the war criminal trial. That can be done internally in the Ummah. But nothing has been done. There is one uh, one party leader who fought against Muslims long time, following the hand of Omar bin Khattab, the Caliph that time. He couldn't kill him. He wanted he want so much to kill him because he killed so many Muslims. Mm. But he couldn't he just kill him. He had to send him to a court. So yeah, right. You know, but that is the civilized way to do it. Okay, so that was all, and then we can go to the time diagnosis and so. But. I want to also do go a little bit to our uh, syllabus there. Okay, um, let's have a little break there. So think of the cookies there <laughs> and the water and uh, stand up, walk around. Okay. May I ask a question? Yes, please, yeah. Okay, so I just go through for the table and I see that operation. What does it mean the religion is going to be that? How how the religion is going to be that one day? Okay, how religions die? Mm. Well, the Syrian religion is dead, the Persian religion is dead, the Egyptian religion is dead. How many religions? I don't know. How many religions is dead? <laughs> I have never counted them, but <laughs> there are more, more who are dead. How, 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 how the process is going to be like? Well, the process, according to my critical theory, is that religions cannot solve the theodicy problem anymore. It is what do you mean, the theodicy problem is to justify the justice of God or the justice of the gods mm -hmm. uh, in the face of the injustices in their world, mm -hmm. the horrible things which happen you know, in the world. And the gods are responsible. They created the world or they administered the world and so on. And all these, the floods, you know, the tsunamis, the wars, the butchery and, and all that. And they do don't do anything. So as long as the uh, religion can justify the gods and can say, well, they did this because of the punishment of your sins, or they did this because they wanted to test you, or so, as long as people accept that on their level of evolution and of education, the religion will last and will go up. But if uh, there is a crisis. And people say, you know, how could that happen? Six mm -hmm. Jews are killed and Yahweh did nothing. Mm -hmm. Yahweh had a covenant with the Jewish people. He wanted to protect them and he didn't, you know. Then people lose their faith oh, and see. the religion dies. Okay. Eighty percent of the Israelis don't believe anything. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Oh. Mm -hmm. We just discussed it this morning. Mm -hmm. But um, the, rabbi will, the rabbi will say, to be secular in Israel is different than to be secular 
in the United States, and then he describes the same situation in Israel as here. So, uh, but uh, eighty percent or so, though the, the most of the kibbutzim are all socialists. They are all secular. The Zionists are secular. They are not religious people. And um, there are two or three uh, kibbutzim which are still religious, but all the others are not. And certainly uh, Haifa and, and is, is secular, and uh, Tel Aviv. They are all totally secular cities. In what terms they are secular and Israelis are different than anywhere, anywhere elsewhere? Anywhere well, he, he said that the secular people in Israel are still learning in the school about festivities or rituals or whatever. I mean, like like a religion department. We do that all, but nobody believes the thing, you know. So, um, uh, so And that's the same thing in America. I mean, it's in both cases. So... Uh, so the uh, secular, that means they have been, you know, they, they have two or three universities and they are very advanced, you know, and they're s- totally secular places. They have studied in Paris, you know, medicine and all these so languages and uh, they are not believing Jews or whatever. Or practice. When you say there is no faith as such in Israel, but it's just the practice of the rituals. They are not practicing the rituals neither. I have I read the part of the syllabus half of it. Yeah, I, I want to talk so about this. Yeah. Because it's yeah. new totally new thing for me. Right, exactly. Yeah. Therefore we want to be very we eager to learn and to understand what right. I'm that. Right, yeah. And you are my only that's, source. That's what we want to do, yeah. That's so our task. I'm, I'm ha- I have a lot of questions, but I don't know if your time ever will be enough for that. Well, we can so do afterwards. Afterwards we can we can do it in our uh, meeting here, or we can do it afterwards, however you want to do it. You can do something now. Do you have one now? Or? Yeah, for example, uh, <coughs> for example Or just more questions like uh, um, uh, here it says that the fasc- uh, fascism fascism and um, racism now in, 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 in 1989 racism fascism and other things defeated socialism. How come that fascism um, no, that can, in 1989 yeah. that was a neoliberal counter-revolution. Yeah. You see, you had a counter-revolution in the 20s where 12 capitalistic countries marched into Russia and wanted to kill them. They have been liberalism, li- liberalist, not fascism, right? This, this yeah, this no, 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 yeah, it's, it's different, yeah. Counter- so there was counter- a liberal counter-revolution in the 20s, 12 capitalistic countries marched in, there are still 6,000 or 8,000 Americans buried in Vermont, then was Hitler, right, that's about the fascist one. No, 1989. 1989 was a neoliberal one. Yeah, this is the, that's yeah, that was the third one. Yeah, this and the third one was the fascist, right? Yeah, but what I understood before that, 1981, it was... Liberist one, liberal, 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 liberal yeah. or capital. So you have a liberal, you have a fascist, Against and a liberal one. So it was in, it was in fact, I uh, understand, I don't know, I'm just trying to understand. It was not racist, or um, uh, fascist uh, counter revolution, it was maybe liberal counter revolution, right? Yeah, yeah, right. So the first one was a liberal, the one is. Second one was a fascist one, the third one was a liberal one again. Because fascists and uh, fascists and liberals and Catholics are all anti-communists, right? They hate communists. Yeah. So this is the third one, 1989. Yeah, the third one. Okay, but because it's he- here, here it says about this one of 1989. It was racist, uh, racism, fascism, uh, no, racism, racism defeated, defeated. Uh, no, let me see. Let me see yeah, what that is there. Yeah. Okay. Oh, now I prefer to be sure, not without the help by the high bourgeois nations and their second front. And then in 1989, racism, tribalism, nationalism, and fascism 
Once more, the field is socialist to be sure that without help of the neoconservative governments of the liberal democratic society. So it's a neoliberal one, but they were fascist elements. So in Kiev, still, you know, we had the, that was the last attempt of this neoliberal counter revolution. There was a combination of fascists and liberals. But even if in Kiev that time, was from the east uh, camp, camp. So it was not yeah, a part of this uh, counter revolution. It was one of its victims. It was not one of. Who? The Who? Uh, where? What? Kiev. 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 Yeah. yeah. Well, Kiev we know well yeah. because we traveled there all the time. You know, we for 12 years yeah. we. The, West, the Western powers yeah. were behind that. Yeah. Maybe right. Account, uh, yeah. Not. Yeah, not. Uh, no, no, but they have their own uh, thing, you know. So in Kiev, the guy who is in power now, he was in my course. Yeah. In in the other, you know, mm -hmm. so um, you no, know, they they have their own yeah. liberalism, they have their own fascism, you know, yeah. during the Second World War, where they yeah. got there yeah. later on. So I'm trying to understand who represents fascism and fascism in this counter revolution. What I mean, Kiev is the last event of that whole complex, right? So and in Kiev they uh, burned down the synagogue again, you know. Uh, which was uh, which liberals Perfect. usually don't do, uh, which fascists did. And I have an article where I mentioned all the different groups there who were active there. You know, the, all the movements, the right sector, the yeah, right, right who worked all together and the tactic, ISIS tactics, which they used as a, in order to say ISIS is annoying. Manufacturing chain. Do you remember what the title was or yeah. what the whole thing was about? There was a whole article that which I described all the every little detail that had the casualties and all this. Was it the huh? one in, it wasn't the one with the Western and Eastern or the American yeah. Slavic? Huh? Okay. This was a question for the yeah. Okay, well let's make it simple, right? We had a liberal um, counter revolution in the twenties. We had a fashion in the forties. And in the 80s, we had a neoliberal again. But with this neoliberal, there were fascist forces involved again. Did the, did the communism reach a type of pra practical fascism in Soviet Yes. There is something like what you can call red fascism. Yeah. But you have to see what red fascism then means. So red means that it was socialism, but that the socialism was perverted. And it was perverted because there had been no liberal time before, no strong bourgeoisie before. So the socialists had to do everything what the bourgeoisie is supposed to do. And so therefore Stalin uh, developed this industrialization program and he built in Siberia you know, hundreds of cities with atomic energy and they had even numbers, they had not even names. And uh, with the Gulag go with forced labor and that's so on. So that his dictatorship, you know, and his personality cult are that uh, contradicted socialism. So it's called red socialism. Uh, red, red fashion, red fashion. What's the relationship between liberalism and positivism? Well, there is a connection between fascism and uh, liberalism uh, fascism and fascism. Liberalism and liberalism. Yeah, positivism and liberalism, positivism and fascism. So what is positivism? Positivism is the metaphysics of what is the case. That somebody studies what is the case, as we do in the sociology department, that is good. That's a good thing, you know, to have facts and data and measure them, measure and measure and measure this beautiful. Where the positivist becomes wrong is that he stops there, that he does not go beyond that and says these facts are horrible. We have to change them, you know. We have to have make a paradigm change or whatever. That is what is bad. That means that he adjusts to them. That he says, you know, it's okay, or the class is half full, or 
it is as it is, and so on. And that is where he becomes uh, conservative, reactionary, and doesn't move anywhere. And that's what everybody wants. That we want to, the students not to become uh, like Bernie, you know, but students are adjusted to what is the case, that they don't dream, have no dreams in their heads, but that they do their job. So, Uh, the struggle between nationalism and socialism. So, Hitler, for example, joined national, national Yeah, we said the same thing like Trump, right? Uh, I mean, Germany crazed again, you know. Uh, the our government is stupid, you know, we are taken out by everybody, and so on. So that's nationalism. So how how did the struggle between nationalism and socialism look like? Look like? Well, I mean, part of that red fascism is that it became very nationalistic in the Russian sense, too, right? So that one didn't know if Russia served socialism or if socialism served Russia. Like with religion, you know, that, that the nation used uh, socialism uh, as a way to make itself powerful. Yeah, that's our old map, yeah. yeah. 
There are cases, for example, in the police guys that have been killed by Saudi police. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm against that. It's not uh, uh, a lot of thing. But Iran killed kill over hundreds, hundreds of scholars. There are also killed hundreds of people. Nobody talks about these people. Now this is the Western policy. When somebody is killed in Lebanon, South, uh, South mm -hmm. Beirut, or killed in Iraq, or killed, they all talk mm -hmm. as if we are crime. But hundreds, thousands of Sunni scholars, and nobody talks about them. So I'm not saying this was good to kill this guy, but we need to be fair on talking about all the victims. It's exactly as talking as about the victims of terrorism if they are white, but yeah. ignoring if they are Muslim. Right, yes, right. So the cases in Iraq, once the Shia took over, they really killed people, civilians. All mm. groups, the militant groups, yeah. and they are Shia, they are Shia. Mm. They are paid by Iran to kill people. You see what ha you see what happened in that city in Iraq last uh, last week. Mm. They killed they killed the, the whole the, the bombed mosque. The Shia bombed mosques of Sunnis and killed a lot of people without any judgment. Just because the militant groups supported by the government, it's about it. This is crime. It's against the law, but it's not. And the same. So I mean, there is the political agreement. Yeah, it's a practice. The problem is, in they have, we have five big differences. When you have big, one of them, they call it the big. Yeah, the the. That they they insert by their belief to show yeah. something what satisfy yeah. others, but yeah. not what yeah. they believe. Yeah. So they see the the death yeah. the sign the grandson of our yeah. to death yeah. today, and they hold us responsible yeah. for the Sunni. So they have a lot of skill against never So I don't see any chance for recreation of the conversation between Sunni and Shia. Unless we work with those technocrats, yeah. not with the latest one of them. They have a lot. I work personally with oh, the, the Grand Minister of Egypt and Sheikh uh, she Plaza mm -hmm. long time on huh? trying to bring them together. Karadawi? Karadawi was Sheikh Plaza, the Grand Minister of Egypt. We failed. I think the first we failed. Of course, yeah. Because because of this, they, they tell us something, we <laughs> put them together, and then huh? after that, they just they did. Okay, let's yes. talk about it later. Yes. We have to go on. Are you ready? Are you ready? Do you yeah, have we are ready. Do we have enough yeah. cookies? Okay, so yeah. we come to something new now. We talked about what we did the last time, type diagnosis, and um, I think we mentioned to take Flint out there. Why do we do this? We want to see what different theories, like liberalism, fascism, socialism, the critical theory, how they are connected with facts which happen events which happen. We call that time diagnosis or time prognosis. So mm -hmm. let's use one fact, recently something happened here in the neighborhood, that is Flint. So let's concentrate on this. That is for the day, that is our time diagnosis. What time is it now? It's 8.20. Uh, 8.20, yeah. so we still have a little time. Okay, so uh, Flint, what happened in Flint? So we have to, when you make a time diagnosis, with the categories of the critical theory, which we don't know yet well, but we just try to do it. So Flint, it's up there. It is a city where General Motors was in there yeah. for many years, and General Motors employed these people. So these people in the 50s had a good life, good income, $60,000 for a worker in the, at the assembly line, mm -hmm. and they could have a quasi-bourgeois life. They could have a car and a little house, and could go to the university and so on. Then, at that time, the competition of General Motors was farmed out. All the car factories in Germany were destroyed, in Japan were destroyed, so they had no competitors. So everything went well until the competition grew up again in Japan and in the thing, so they got in trouble. And the, in order to solve that, the Flint uh, corporations went to Mississippi and went to South America and went to China and to India in order to find cheap labor cheap resource. So capitalism must essentially always find cheap labor because the level of profit must always go up. Mm -hmm. If you stay on the same level, you are a loser. Mm -hmm. So in order to get up, and they have the challenges of the competition in Germany and Japan again and so on, they had to move out. Not that the capitalists were bad people or that we 
want to deprive you of your work or whatever. They simply, it's the law of the market. Mm -hmm. You have to increase uh, uh, the, your profit continually, otherwise it goes down. And the others win in Japan and Germany and so on. So that's what they did. And that means that the people in Flint were workless. They had no work anymore. So the whole city went down. Now, Flint is also the city where the labor union was born. In the 1920s, there was a sit-in strike. So the workers were just sitting for two or three weeks or so, and the capitalists came with their thugs and they beat them up, and finally the government, the Roosevelt government, intervened, and it intervened on the side of the workers. It protected them against those thugs of the capitalists and such. So after that, the labor union was introduced. The labor unions created what they call every day the middle class. Mm -hmm. It's the low middle class. It's not shopkeepers. That's the old middle class. They created a new middle class, namely well-paid workers who could live as if they were middle class. And as the, uh, the, the, more, the higher the wages were, the more the workers were endangered. So in Flint, where the, where the wages, and other towns here too, were pushed up, that is where then General Motors moved out. 20,000 jobs lost, 50,000 jobs lost, and so on and so on. And so the whole city went down, Detroit as well, and others as well. So now more recently, something happened. The Detroit and Flint, there were commissioners were put in or whatever. Emergency, what are Emergency they called? Emergency managers. Emergency managers, they have absolute power. That means the mayor has nothing to say, city commission, nothing. They have absolute power. So this fellow then decided that when the Detroit water supply, which comes from the lakes and is good water, mm -hmm. the Detroit, because they got bankrupt, increased the price of that good water. The, com the guy there, the manager, emergency manager, then said we have to save. So he cut the line to Detroit and took the water out of the Flint River. Oh, then Flint River water was polluted by, what's this metal? Lead. Lead, by lead, by lead, by the lead pipes. So the whole system rests on lead pipes and that lead stuff put this poisonous stuff into the water, so even when you bath, you'll get something. But the, the Legionnaire's disease uh, broke out because of that, and uh, I don't know how many people died from it, but then 6,000 children were uh, endangered who now have it in their bloodstream, mm -hmm. and it slows down their brain, their education, yeah. and so on and so on. So therefore, the, uh, uh, this was found out, now, and the, uh, the manager was responsible, but also the governor. So, let me read you now for the, uh, uh, what, this Michael Moore, and we will see a short, uh, but some scenes of that movie so that you can really see it, right? So we have to bring together a theory. If we were liberals, we would do that. If we were fascists, we would do that. If we were socialists, we would do that. So all these people have a theory. And we do not study those theories now, but we study the critical theory. But we have to see also how it is related to the other theories, because it was developed against the fascist theory. It was developed against liberalism. It was against, against the Soviet system, etc. So, therefore, that is our procedure. That's our strategy. Now, let me read to you here now what this Michael Moore, who made that movie, which we will see some scenes from, about Flint, which is his home, hometown. Uh -huh. He wrote this letter there to the Attorney General of the state of Michigan. Um, we, the undersigned, so thousands of people signed this letter here just a few days ago. Including me. <laughs> Including, yeah. Oh, well, well. <laughs> we, yeah. the undersigned, call upon you, that means the, uh, to the, the attorney, to investigate and, if warranted, arrest and prosecute the governor of Michigan Rick Snyder. Rick Snyder is a neoliberal who introduced the right to work law, which represses the union, including the one I have founded at Western Michigan University, and so on. So it makes it very difficult for these unions to operate, and so on. So it's an overall thing. We have it in other states too, where we have neoliberal, uh, neoliberal governors. 
Rick Schneider for violating the Environmental Protection Agency's regulations in cutting off clean drinking water to the city of Flint, nicht from Detroit, and making the citizens instead drink polluted water, which is completely dark when you see it there, uh, drink polluted water from the Flint River for fraud and political corruption and for covering up the criminal actions of his administration. The children of Flint, already among the poorest, here you have class in Flint, so because the working work went out, the whole society went down and got poor and poor and poor and so on. So the children of Flint, already among the poorest in the U.S., will now have to endure a life of pain, irreversible brain damage, and lower IQs because of Governor Snyder's actions. There is no way to totally reverse the effects of lead in a child's blood system. Three, at the very least, justice must be served and other elected officials must be put on notice by the actions you will take against the Governor, that people's lives are more important than balancing a budget, because that was the reason why they were put on the bad water. Okay, so why do we show it? Because we want to have concrete examples. Now, Michael Moore is not a critical theorist, but he has a lot of ideas which he shares with the critical theory. So, like, like Bernie Sanders has a lot of ideas which he shares with the critical theory. So in order to show where the critical theory is practical today, where somebody is really doing it to action of which inspired by this, that's Michael Moore. Michael Moore is a Catholic. Michael Moore went to the St. Joseph's Sisters in Flint. They are also here. So the sisters educated them. When he brings out a new movie, he has a new movie now. I knew the name tonight. It came it's, up again. Um, Who Do We Invade Next? Or something Who, like Who Will We Invade Next? Yeah, that's the next movie. So um, that's about American uh, uh, regime change. I think it's 26 regime changes we have done. So, no less. So we will show, and he, he goes to Mass, he is an active Catholic, and he puts the social teaching of the Catholic Church, which is some, in some things connected with the Codigal Theory. Uh, Codigal Theory goes further, but so he puts that into practice by making these movies. Now, 20 years ago, he had made that movie, uh, uh, Roger and Me. Roger was the uh, the uh, CEO of General Motors in Flint at that time. After he made the movie, he was fired, and even his pension was cut and so on. Others were fired to appear in the movie and so on. So he had some effect because it's not enough to practice a theory; you also have to be effective. You cannot simply say, well, I tried, you know, and then it didn't work. Or what? <laughs> so uh, that uh, everybody does that. So you have to see, is it effective? And so we have a very concrete case here, a concrete city with a particular class system, with a la large proletariat, a very small bourgeoisie, um, which owns the means of production, that means machinery and so on, and at the same time have taken that machinery out and have put it into the Mississippi, and so on and so on, in order to increase the profit, because they lowered and lowered the wages, and so they also go to socialistic countries, like China. Um, these socialistic countries, also Stalin, what they do is, they want to know, have the know-how of the capitalists. So they invite the capitalists. The capitalists, of course, exploit their workers. But they then compensate the workers by free university, free education, free health care, and so on and so on. So they allow the capitalists a certain amount of greed and robbery in order to get those factories, to get these machines, and to get these products. At a certain point, then they can throw them out. So my uncles, for instance, in Germany with Siemens, it's a big corporation, they went to Russia. They built the Russian factories with which the Russians then built the tanks against, which they, against the Germans. So. But nevertheless, even Stalin invited the capitalist firms in order to get their know-how, their technology, their machinery, and, and so on and so on, until they can do it themselves, and then they send them home. So that is what... what uh, uh, yes. I have a question here. <coughs> is it because I thought much about that. When I have a factory in my country uh, that's owned by somebody else, yeah. does that that help me ha getting the know-how, or this is always... Well, like I mean, so what they do, 
my son. We yeah. have factories of genuine metals in, in Cairo, yeah. Egypt, for example. But I feel like Egyptians never get the know-how because they close and they employ some people they want. And yeah. and well, I mean, uh, when you are on the you know on the capitalistic side, as a liberal or as a fascist, or so, you think that these people are caught inferior and they will never learn anything. So, uh, but when you are on the other side, you know, from the socialist government point of view, somehow they try to uh, exploit each other. So they say, okay, you are greedy people, you know, that's all what you want. So, okay, you can satisfy your greed here, we allow you this, you know, but then they compensate for it by government programs of all kinds, so that the exploitation is not too bad. But then, at a certain point, they want to get rid of it. Now, if it's not a socialist country, or not China, or whatever, they may just take it and not learn anything. Because from a fascist or liberal point of view, for instance, Africans, you know, or, let's see, Germany was allied with Japan. They thought that the Japanese could o only fly, for instance, German airplanes and so on, uh, because the first settlers in Japan were Aryans. And these Aryans taught those Asians, you know, how to uh, bicycle or whatever. They, otherwise, they couldn't have done it at all. So um, that is the attitude. But this is one attitude. The other attitude is the one who will let it come in. And the socialists, you know, have a certain purpose on it. So they just, uh, like, like you catch a fish with putting a little fly on it, you know, catch them. So they say, okay, here's a wonderful country. Come here. And so Putin said that recently too. Come, you capitalists, you know, there's Putin, there's Trump there. You're beautiful. Just come, invite them. You know, then at a certain point when the greed gets too much and the power too much, they cut the greed, put them into prison and throw them out of the country. So that means you treat the capitalist as if he was a cow, and you give him something to eat so that he produces milk. And then you want to produce that milk yourself someday, you but you have to know <laughs> until the cow, uh, you know, you have to imitate the cow, or whatever. Okay, so this is it clear now, pedagogically, why we proceed that way, as we do, right? We want to make it visible, and it is very, very difficult to get through an Egyptian ideology, bourgeois ideology, or to wherever it may be, in Saudi Arabia or here, you know, because of this ideology, this necessary appearance, which they all build up, with all the arguments and the prejudices and so on. It's a jungle, and to break through that jungle, you know, we have to uh, try to do that. So, here is Michael Moore, he's not a good theorist, but he has some ideas, he has a certain attitude towards he would still be for Roosevelt liberalism, I think, you know, like Clinton. He would maybe also be close, you know, to Bernie now. Yeah, I think, I think he would go over to Bernie now, but um, so, but he started out as a Roosevelt liberal, and he would say, you know, it was so good in the 50s, my father had such a good time, and now look what Flint looks like, right? But you have a real city, like Detroit, you have a real city in Flint with real people, and how does that work then, right? Because it has to get out of the head somehow, out into the, into the real world, and it has to work in the real world. So we have to see if, uh, if um, this, these movies, he made maybe 10 movies now and so on, and he himself has to say, you know, it hasn't worked at all, you know? That's another thing which you see. So it has not worked, it has not influenced, influenced the elections, you know? Uh, it has not stopped the wars. It has not stopped the criminality and so on. Lives here north of here in a nice town there, and he goes on and made. I thought it was the last movie was Capitalism, a love story. I thought it was the last one, but now he came up with a new one, and he has recognized worldwide with the film festivals and so on. So they are good movies. But <laughs> when people look at these movies, you know they are Im immunized. They like getting an injection, mm -hmm. so they say, "Well, that is more." Ah, oh, that's more. And we know already what he will say, so they don't look at the movie. Oh, okay. So it is then those who, you know, the students and so on, they see it, but they don't have much power or so. So it is with Bert Brecht, you know, it's closer to the Frankfurt School. <laughs> he had these plays, you know, like uh, City of Mahagoni or the, uh, um, what is it, for the Chicago about the... St. John of the Stockyards. St. John of the Stockyards and so on. And it's interesting that the bourgeoisie looks at these <laughs> plays and not the workers. It is for the liberation of the workers, but it is the, the exploiters who look at it. 
And we have the same thing with the bourgeoisie. The music of Beethoven and Mozart and so on is revolutionary bourgeois music. Wow. You know who listened to it? The feudal lords. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> feudal lords paid for it, and so and you have the same thing what you have with the feudal lords What's and the bourgeoisie. The you have now with the bourgeoisie and the working class again a repetition. Mm-hmm. So um, the uh, so the, the in the Soviet Union, they then sent this uh, the workers into ballets or revolutionary music and so on and paid for it. And so on. but um, but th- th- I mean the irony is that the one who will be guillotined is the one who enjoys the the place which will guillotine him and not those who are next in line to be liberated and to take over. Who, so who listen to Beethoven you said? Hmm? Who listen to Beethoven? Or or what, uh, Beethoven or you know yeah. uh, I mean the, the music which was played at the time when the French Revolution uh, took place, right? So, so Mozart, Beethoven, Beethoven, that's all revolutionary music. Both but it has it's now called classical that means it has moved in history, you know, because it belongs to a revolution which is gone. So, but you need, in order to make another revolution, remember what we said, the commune and so on and so on and so on, the bourgeoisie, you know, uh, excluded, the excluded rise then, and they have to revolutionize the music, the place and so on. So most of the talking of being bourgeois? Hmm? They're bourgeois. They yeah, they're bourgeois. bourgeois. That's bourgeois. But they were bought yeah. paid for. They huh? were paid for them by the aristocracy. Yeah, they were paid by the aristocracy. And, and I mean, Brecht, you know, was also paid, of course. He worked in Hollywood. I see you sometimes use bourgeois as kind of near to aristocracy, and sometimes you use it as middle class. No, it's a class. Yes, middle class. Bourgeoisie is the middle class. The bourgeoisie made the revolution. So they killed the, lo- the feudal lords. They killed the clergy. Why then there is the problem between working class? Work they're, the, they're the ruling yeah. class now. They are the ruling class now. See, now this dialectic, you have to think in transitions, in motions, right? So you have to get rid of your positivistic static stuff. You have to go over now. Think, you know, think continually. Time, uh, the truth has a time core, so everything moves. So that means Beethoven and Mozart were revolutionary part of the bourgeois revolution. But they are not part necessarily of the uh, 